Yeah, you know who it is. And for those of you that don't, I am Satonius, the opposite of the Phonius Duh! from Speak Geek Unlimited. And today I'll be reviewing the 1998 film that started it all, but doesn't get the credit it deserves. Talk about Blade. It may be hard to believe, but a long, long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, comic book movies didn't rule the box office. Once upon a time, the only two characters that could get people to see a movie with comic book characters was Batman or Superman. For years, Marvel tried to get their characters on the big screen with several failed attempts, including the 1989 film The Punisher starring Dolph Lundgren, the 1990 film Captain America, and the 1994 Fantastic Four film made by Roger Corman. Not one of these films managed to generate positive reviews or financial success, or start a trend of successful Marvel films. The owner of that title goes to the underrated and underappreciated Blade. Created in 1973 by writer Marv Wolfman and artist Gene Colan, and first appearing in the comic Tomb of Dracula in issue number 10, Blade can be considered the first black vampire hunter in comic books. But what's really interesting is that Blade is also the foundation that the Marvel Cinematic Universe is built upon. Don't believe me? Let's take a look at the defining traits of the MCU and how Blade did them first. Sarcastic, quick-witted, charming male protagonist. Check. Unique supporting characters. Check. Capable female sidekick, possible love interest. Check. Underwhelming villain. Also check. Even go as far as saying that the black leather, slow bullet time, Hong Kong fast paced fight choreography seen in The Matrix one year later in 1999 was done by Blade first in 1998. It's easy to overlook Blade as an influential film in a world where we have movies like Captain America Civil War, Guardians of the Galaxy 2, The Avengers, and Iron Man. Starring a rejuvenated Wesley Snipes as the day walking vampire hunter Blade and Chris Christopherson as his surrogate father figure mentor Whistler. The film focuses on Blade and his war against the sub-society of vampires led by Deacon Frost, played by Stephen Dorff, who wants to gain the power of the vampire god La Magra. Meanwhile, Blade rescues and aligns himself with Dr. Karen Jensen, the hematologist who was bitten by one of Frost's vampire flunkies. To avoid becoming a bloodsucker, she develops a serum that cures vampirism and helps Blade and Whistler in their war against vampires. The Blade in the film is nothing like the comic book character. The original version from the source material was based on a composite of black actors and athletes from the 1970s, including football player and actor Jim Brown and O.J. Simpson. In the comic, Blade was an everyman type of vampire hunter of British descent. He was trained by a black blind jazz musician and former vampire hunter named Jamal Afari. A lot of Blade's personality and mythology is revised for the film. A film for Blade had been in development since the mid-1990s with actors like Lawrence Fishburne, LL Cool J, and Snoop Dogg ready to play Blade. We could talk about how shitty that would have been at another time in another video, but Wesley Snipes became involved with the project after his plans to make a Black Panther film fell through with Marvel. Directed by Stephen Norrington, the special effects artist who got his start on films like Aliens, Blade was the second film Norrington directed, with the first being the low-budget film called Death Machine. The movie was written by David S. Goyer, who has made a career out of writing some of the best and worst comic book movie films of all times, including Batman Begins in the Dark Knight, Batman vs. Superman, and Man of Steel. Snipes and Goyer retooled Blade from what New Line Cinema had originally envisioned as a spoof of vampire films into the horror martial arts superhero film we know today. Wesley Snipes plays Blade as a stoic and precise man of action. The name Blade is less of a nickname and more of a declaration of his mission. He's sharp, swift, and absolute. The film has a very strong and often overlooked vibe of black exploitation films. Blade exists as a modern day interpretation of John Shaft, drenched in layers of black and embodies an acerbic wit and a no-nonsense style approach to killing vampires. Vampires in the film represent the white power establishment, or in terms of black exploitation, the man. Blade is a film drenched in philosophical subtext. The vampires in the film are stratified by class and status, with pure blooded vampires representing an upper class aristocracy, with term vampires representing a disenfranchised youth aesthetic, with Deacon Frost at the forefront of that movement. 
the human beings are considered sheep or asleep to the truth. If this sounds familiar, it should. It's the plot of the Matrix. The thing is that the Matrix came out a year later. Each of the main characters are similar to Matrix characters. Blade can be considered the Neo of the film, and he's the chosen one. As the Daywalker, Blade has all of the strengths of the vampires and of their weaknesses. Similar to Neo, Blade used guns and stylistic martial arts to take out vampires. Unlike Neo, Blade is sure of himself and very callous. Karen Jensen is also similar to Thomas Anderson, aka Neo. She's Alice, going deeper down the rabbit hole. At first she's timid and docile, but the deeper she goes into the world of Blade and vampire culture, the more she becomes like Blade. Abraham Whistler is a character that was created in the 1994 Spider-Man animated series as Blade's mentor. David Goyer describes Whistler as the avuncular father figure. The character Whistler was based on a modern day version of Abraham Van Helsing, the vampire hunter, created by writer Abraham Bram Stoker. In the film, Whistler is similar to Morpheus in the Matrix. He trains Blade and he creates the weapons that he uses. In the Matrix, free thought is the catalyst that the philosophy of the film is built on. In the Matrix, the freer your mind, the more you can do. In Blade, blood serves as the elemental metaphor for power. Each main character and their relationship to blood is associated with empowerment or oppression. Blade is both empowered by his vampire blood and he feels oppressed by his need to feed. Karen is oppressed by the fact that she was bitten by Quinn, one of Frost's vampire flunkies, and is slowly turning into a vampire. Karen Jensen and Blade have paralleling arcs in the movie that go in opposite directions. While Blade is a stoic warrior with little empathy, Karen is empathic and compassionate, but through her interactions with Blade and Whistler, she becomes more of a warrior. I think Karen and Blade have good chemistry that doesn't revolve around sexual tension or romance. This was an interesting choice that seems to be progressive, especially in 1998, but I do wonder if it was decided that Blade and Karen can't be lovers because a positive black heterosexual relationship may have been too much for mainstream audiences around that time. You'll never know, I guess. Uh, Blade and Karen are partners and nothing more. To be honest, this works for a lot of reasons. It flips the idea in films that love conquers all trauma. Blade doesn't open up or become expressive all of a sudden because that's not who Blade is. Blade is an instrument, a weapon, purely functional. As we'll see in other superhero movies, the Force love story doesn't work except to show that the hero actually likes women. And for a film about vampires who are usually sexualized and romanticized, this film treats vampires as a sexually transmitted disease that needs to be cured. What's interesting about Blade and Karen is that she's not intended to be a love interest but a reflection of his mother. He saves her simply because she reminds him of his mother. The dynamic between Blade, Whistler, and Karen is more akin to a nuclear family, with Whistler as the father, Karen as the mother, and Blade as the son. Blade's journey in the film is about coming to terms with who he is and making peace with himself. In the DVD commentary, writer David S. Goyer states that in order to become a fully realized person, one must free themselves from the restrictions and guidance of their parents. He paraphrases a statement from director David Fincher that states, in order to attain enlightenment, you must kill your mother, kill your father, and kill Buddha. Throughout the film, we see a plant with three portions to it. A strong symbol throughout the film is the number three. The family dynamics and relationships in the film are broken into threes. First we have Blade, Whistler, and Karen. Then we have Frost, Mercury, and Quinn as a twisted incestuous brother-sister trio. Last we have Blade, Frost, and Vanessa Brooks as mother, father, and son. When Whistler dies, Blade cuts the roots from the plant, which represents Blade cutting his ties to Whistler, but really cutting his ties to the emotional attachment. And at this point, it's when Blade becomes unrestrained and merciless. Early in the film, when Blade kills vampires, he's having fun. But after the death of Whistler, he becomes more absolute and less playful. He's all about business. As a fan of Hong Kong cinema and martial arts films, I want to take a moment to talk about the fight choreography of Blade. Snipes really shows his deep knowledge of techniques ranging from Taekwondo, Pinchuk Silat, Karate, Capoeira, Wing Chun Kung Fu, and several other styles. 
American martial arts films are usually very limited with a one-two basic rhythm of fighting that focuses on wide punches and maybe a handful of kicking techniques. But the way Blade fights is unlike anything in American action cinema up to that point. The choreography is fast paced and kinetic and it avoids using shaky cam to compensate for bad choreography and sloppy techniques. A lot of people look at Blade 2 as the best movie of the franchise. I think that has a lot to do with the second film embracing the vampire aesthetic. The first film contrasts the vampire world by making Blade a vampire in Brooklyn. In my opinion, none of the other films present the contrast in themes and ideas that the first film does. Blade is a character torn between his nature as a bloodthirsty vampire and his self-loathing and self-hatred of his vampire heritage. It's safe to say that Blade is a bit of a vampire Uncle Tom. Blade's hatred of the thirst seems to come from the fact that not only was his mother bitten by a vampire while he was in the womb, but also has to do with the lack of control over his urges, and Blade is a character defined by control. If I had to speak on any of the shortcomings in the film, it would probably be Deacon Frost, who is a little inconsistent in his performance. Steven Dorff has a ton of screen presence, but he doesn't really feel like a threat to someone like Blade. In the comics, Deacon Frost is usually portrayed as an older man of European descent. Steven Dorff said that he based his performance on Jack Nicholson's Joker from the Batman 89 film. I wouldn't go as far as saying that he was miscast. I actually can't see anyone else as this version of Deacon Frost, and I definitely think that making Frost a young vampire rock star type of dude was inspired. I think the issue lies with whether or not I believe that Steven Dorff could pose a threat to Wesley Snipes. A fun fact about Deacon Frost was that Jet Li was originally supposed to play the character, but chose to do Lethal Weapon 4. I know there are people out there that think the final fight between Blade and Deacon Frost as La Magra was kind of weak and I can agree with that. But keep in mind that it was a last minute change. The original ending was different with Frost turning into a blood swirling tornado. We could talk about how shitty that would have been at another time. I honestly don't know what they could have done to improve it but for what it is, Blade is a dope ass film. Overall, I think Blade is an underrated gem. This film redefined comic book movies, it redefined vampire film mythology, and this movie along with Spawn in 1997 gave us a black superhero for the modern age. I'm not going to do the typical rating system thing, I just wanted to give a little bit of shine to a movie I think is great. Film reviews and film analysis are always a slippery slope and I don't want to tell people what to like. I just want to analyze film and show people that there's more beneath the surface. So with that being said, I'm still Satonius and I'm still the opposite of the phonius and this is still Speak Geek Unlimited. So get at me next time when I'll be discussing the film.